you join me as I've really just recently made a pretty big decision in my 30 plus years of astronomy and astrophotography. And the decision has been largely influenced by several things. If you follow my channel, you know some of my challenges from imaging right here in the backyard. And that is the sky access is very limited in the back to anything above zero degrees declination, which as you know, is very limiting. And what really kind of made me move on this decision earlier this spring was we at least finally got some clear nights only to be socked in by the Canadian wildfires. So the decision I have made is to send this gear to Starfront Observatories in Texas. And this is my journey. Thought I'd share with you in two parts, the preparation of the equipment and then the journey to and getting things set up. So thanks for joining me. This is the Starfront Observatories Remote Telescope Operation Testing Setup and Gear. Let me show you what gear I'm gonna be sending out to Texas. This is the setup we've been working on several nights. Most of it has been in place for a while. I do have a couple of new things I'm still testing and I'm waiting on one final piece. But let me go over some of the details here real quick. First off is the astrophysics will be the main telescope. It's a 130 Starfire EDF Gran Turismo with dew heater. This thing I've had probably, I don't know if I've had it 10 years, but pretty close. Then uh, there's the Botter uh, finder scope slash uh, guide scope that has the, uh, the uh, CWO ASI 120mm camera on it. And all this is riding in a dovetail plate. Uh, combination, it's an astrophysics dovetail plate. Then we just upgraded the focuser to the larger astrophysics focuser so we could accommodate the full frame camera, the ZWO ASI 6200MM Pro with the electronic filter wheel. Now, one of the new things I just added was the electronic focuser. Let me stop right here. I'll show you the first night with that focuser. Sometimes things go smoothly first night, sometimes they don't. Let me show you what happened. Okay, we are out here running the first integration of the autofocus on the 130 Astrophysics 130 scope. What this will do is try to find a, a V curve, you know, in focus, inside of focus and then on the outside of focus and then find the middle point and it'll dial in to the focus point. I'm on the luminance filter. So let's see how this works. Very first time trying it with this. I have had experience with the electronic focuser on the 135 setup with the 2600 mm but this looks like it's going perfect. Now I had, I set the focuser at the, uh, the the reference point on the focus tube is 30. So I, when I attached the electronic focuser, I left that default as close to 30 as I could get. So th I'm not surprised it looks like it's working well. The V curve has succeeded. So now it's gonna try to drill in and find the focal point. We are very early. We are still in twilight here. So it's not anywhere close to being dark. But there's still a good field of stars to work with. And we're going to refine this here. Let's see where we get. Let's see where it's doing a two second exposure on, on this. Okay, so we're getting, getting closer here. Probably do a few more iterations and be happy focus point position succeeded at 38,296 so that was good that went very well and uh, we are ready to use electronic focuser for our remote observatory setup so we're going to check the box on that I'll try it with some other filters here in a bit but unless uh, something else pops up I'd say this is a success 
So this is the spacing I have to reach back focus, and I have an astrophysics spacer. I have a custom <laughs> spacer here. There's a one millimeter ring in between these two. Then I actually went to using the off-axis guider. I've tried to use it, but I'll be honest, I just find using a guide scope so much more flexible and doesn't get in the image path, the pathway of the light cone. And I just like a guide scope separately. So I've got that dialed in. All of this is riding on the Astrophysics Mach 1 mount, tried and true. I've had this for years. I don't even know how long. And the mount interface as well. I'm going to use the with the ASI Air Plus. Just interface with the uh, control panel here on the Astrophysics mount. Just using this RS-232 port to USB conversion. And what you find out when you have all of this interconnectivity, the electronic filter wheel, the electronic focus, the guide camera, the mount, that you start to run out of USB ports. But I, I think I still have plenty. I also have one item I'm waiting for. That is the flat panel, Deep Sky Daddy flat panel, observatory panel. It will allow me to do flats and keep the uh, scope covered automatically I just received the deep sky dad what is this thing called again the OFP2 observatory flat panel 2 maybe for the 130 EDF with the corresponding cables that work with the ASI air coordination let's see how they work So we are a couple of weeks out from the last time I really updated any videos, still working on putting the system together because I decided to change my mind about one critical component. And that component is the, uh, I exchanged out the off-axis guider for a camera angle adjuster. I just felt like the camera angle adjuster was really critical for my compositions at this focal length and for either mosaicing or just single frame uh, capture. So I wanted to add that camera angle adjuster and we're working on that tonight. What happened though, I brought about my own tragedy and I'll show you some pictures here. When I was changing out the system and working on some backspacing, I dropped the TCC3 flattener which is inside the focuser of the astrophysics. If you look at this piece, you can see the pictures and it's a heavy piece. And my gut went into, into the depths I've rarely felt before when that hit these pavers. And, and you can see in the pictures, it dented the flattener. And I'll show you the, uh, the repaired piece from astrophysics and I just can't give astrophysics enough kudos because they turned this piece around very quickly. I thought I was gonna have my whole trip Labor Day weekend put in jeopardy by my carelessness in dropping that TCC. So uh, thank you astrophysics. So everything works remotely through the ASI Air, largely. I can park the scope to home, I can control it, I can turn ASI Air on and off, but I can't turn the scope on and off. If you know astrophysics, you go through an AC to DC inverter, and that has to plug into AC power. So the observatory, Starfront, has a nice solution. It's the CASA Wi-Fi power strip. Let me show you that. So the Casa Wi-Fi power strip has six outlets and three USBs. And I went ahead and labeled them. They are assigned via software and you can power on and off the unit just through a simple Wi-Fi connection. 
So like I said, I've done several nights of testing with all the remote operation of the system. I have one image that's complete. I'm gonna share that with you here. It's the Tulip Nebula going over into the Wolf Ray at 134, I believe is the designation area in Cygnus. And it's an H-alpha composition. So I'm gonna share that with you here. channel you know that about five years ago I did experiment with a sighting spring remote observatory in Australia and I had a little internal debate with myself about the I guess pureness of accessing images via uh, internet telescopes so let me show you the clip that I made in 2020 about using remote telescopes Okay, so we're talking about using remote telescopes. And if you're like me, I really never considered it. I liken it to the analogy of, would Ansel Adams have ever set up his large format camera and Wi-Fi in to the photo that it was taking at the base of one of the great Yosemite landscapes? I don't know that that's a fair analogy. I've really, the other side of that is, if you know Ansel Adams, he was all about technology and utilizing the technology that was available to reach and express your vision. There are really two sides to the Ansel Adams analogy, and that's where I am today. Here's what I want you to think about. Think about using remote imaging, at least as part of a tool in your toolbox. Here's some reasons why. Clouds. We have a lot of clouds here in Appalachia, in the eastern U.S. These observatories are at world-class locations. Do they have clouds? Yeah, they have clouds, but they have a lot less often than I do in my backyard. Remote telescopes in both hemispheres. Southern Hemisphere gives you access to some beautiful, world-class objects that you may never get a chance to image in your lifetime. You get to use telescopes, focal lengths, cameras you would never own. These are multi-thousand dollar systems. Did I mention clouds? We have clouds a lot. Here in the east. If you've never had good high quality data from a dark sky, this is a, an eye-opening experience when you take a luminance frame of 10 minute exposures and see how good the data is with these high quality cameras. Take a narrow band filter image, supplement your own RGB image. The rates are cheaper during moon periods. The fuller the moon, the cheaper the rate. When you consider astronomical imaging to be one where the imager should be under the stars, Albeit not the entire night, I'm certainly not out the entire night, most of the time. At a star party, I might be. But if they have to be out under the night sky to be legitimate, which I used to think, you know, to really be a legitimate astrophotographer, you need to be out, you need to be cold, you need to see the frost on the scope. You need to hear the animal noises, feel the deer breathing down your neck, have the deer snort at you. I still believe that's a big part of astrophotography. We really should consider using remote observatories to capture things we'll never be able to capture in our lifetime to supplement some of our own personal work. So I want you to consider using a remote telescope in your own astronomical imaging goals. This is the setup. Fully tested, marked, labeled, and ready for packing. To follow up on my previous video about the legitimacy of remote observatory, I can tell you after spending the last six weeks getting this setup, my setup, prepared and ready for Starfront, I feel complete legitimacy in all of the imaging that's going to take place at this fantastic new location. We finally are here. We are eight weeks into preparation, planning, equipment damage, equipment repair, and we are leaving for Texas in the morning. The F-150 Lightning is my travel truck and the frunk is really invaluable, secure, hideaway storage. Everything's in here, telescope, extra cables, part of the mount. And then in the bed, we do have the 
mount and uh, the counterweights and a power a power module the AC DC conversion so wish me luck this is the end of part one we have prepared and we are ready to get to Starfront Observatories. So I'm looking forward to uh, updating you in part two uh, as I cover some of the journey from West Virginia to Texas and how the delivery process went and uh, some kind of a timeline on when we can, can expect first light from Starfront. So thanks for joining me on this video. This has been a great learning experience and I'm looking forward to seeing this equipment in operation at Starfront and being much more efficient in gathering data for making fine art prints in the future. Thanks a lot. Take care.